Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Your support helps make our work possible. And remember that tuition is voluntary at Patreon. We also have Academy theme gear available. There are links in the description for both of these. We appreciate you. The Starship rocket is an amazing system, but it must make it safely to space several times to be human rated for launch. How many times will it have to safely land before this maneuver will be considered safe for human passengers? And is there a safer way to get people to and from low Earth orbit? Today we are going to look in depth at an innovative spacecraft that may be a better choice than Starship for getting humans to and from low Earth orbit. For the last 70 years, humanity has struggled to break through the atmosphere of Earth and climb to space. The first few minutes of rocket flight burn an enormous amount of the rocket's resources. We have discussed in other lectures how the massive Saturn V had to burn 74% of its propellant just to get 62 kilometers above the Earth. Are there more efficient ways to get this done? What about using jet aircraft technology? These have been flying safely for over half a century. Here is the highest flying jet airplane of all time. This is the SR-71 Blackbird. The SR-71 was a spy plane designed to overfly the Soviet Union and take pictures. This design was known as the A-12 when flown by NASA for research purposes. A-12 is now famous as part of the name of Elon Musk's youngest son. I think Blackbird would have been cool too, but no one asked me. The armed combat version of the SR-71 was called the YF-12. At some point, Elon's son may ask, why the F, Dad? These amazing airplanes could fly to an altitude of 26 kilometers above the Earth. At this altitude, they could cruise at a speed of Mach 3.2, 3.2 times the speed of sound at that altitude. The SR-71 and its relatives would take off without a lot of fuel, then refuel in the air and climb to operational altitude. It could fly about 4,000 kilometers before needing to refuel. Rockets burn over half of their mass within just a few minutes to reach this same altitude. The main difference between a rocket and a jet is that rockets carry their oxidizer with them, while jets pull oxygen from the air. That makes the jets more efficient, but limits the altitude at which they can fly. It has been reported that the SR-71 could operate as high as 30 kilometers, but even at 26 kilometers, it was already above 97% of Earth's atmosphere. People have also asked, why can't we use jet engines on the first stage instead of rocket engines? Why can't we pull oxygen from the air until we are above 25 kilometers? That is an excellent question, and we're going to look at one version of this option. The first use of this concept was probably the X-15. The X-15 program has been called the most successful aeronautical research effort in history. The U.S. Air Force wanted to study hypersonic flight. Hypersonic is when an object moves through the air above Mach 5. They wanted to also study leaving and entering the atmosphere. A jet aircraft cannot leave the atmosphere, and most planes could never survive hypersonic flight. The Germans during World War II had begun perfecting the jet engine, and they had experimented with rocket planes. These could fly faster and higher than any jet, but only for a very brief period of time. Carrying both your fuel and oxidizer increases your mass so you will have a massive, slow rocket plane that can fly for a longer time, or a smaller, fast one that can only fly for a few minutes. The Germans had built and tested several rocket fighter planes, and had even planned to fly one above the atmosphere and across the world to bomb the United States. The Nazis were defeated before they could carry out these plans, but the Americans had access to all this research and designed something new. This was the X-15. Three of these were built with the goal of achieving a speed of Mach 6 and an altitude of 250,000 feet, or 75 kilometers. To accomplish this, the plane would need to start above most of the Earth's atmosphere. The plane was designed to have an XLR-99 rocket engine. This engine burned anhydrous ammonia fuel 
and liquid oxygen oxidizer. Propellant tank pressure was maintained with helium gas, and there were tanks of hydrogen peroxide that could be run over a catalyst bed, turning into high temperature steam and oxygen, which would power a turbo pump to pump the propellant. These engines were built by Thiokol and could produce a force of 125 to over 250 kilonewtons of thrust. This is the equivalent of 608,000 horsepower for my American friends. The rockets had a high altitude specific impulse of 279 seconds. The first two X-15s built were first tested with the much weaker XLR-11 engine, the same type used on the Bell 1 that broke the sound barrier. These could only produce a little less than 75 kilonewtons of thrust, but this was enough for the planes to reach a speed of over 2,000 miles per hour. With the more powerful XLR-99 at full throttle, the planes could reach over 4,000 miles per hour. The X-15A was also built, which had more fuel, increasing the firing duration from 83 seconds for the first versions to over 150 seconds for the second version. To save mass, the X-15 used skids to land, which required it to come down on a dry lake bed. This was usually Rogers Dry Lake at Edwards Air Force Base in California, but emergency landings were made on other dry lake beds several times. The X-15 was carried to a high altitude by a B-52 bomber, usually about 14 kilometers or 45,000 feet, at a speed of about 800 kilometers per hour. The X-15 would be dropped and then ignite its rocket engine. It would use normal airplane controls. These were two rudders on these vertical stabilizers to control yaw, and these horizontal flaps at the back, which could be moved together to pitch up or down, or moved oppositely to roll. Once outside the atmosphere, the X-15 would use tiny hydrogen peroxide thrusters to control the plane. These were at the nose for pitch and yaw, and on the outer wing surfaces for roll. The X-15A could only burn for a little more than two minutes, but in those two minutes, it would point upward, building speed and throwing itself above the atmosphere. This would create a ballistic arc that allowed about 12 minutes of research time at hypersonic speeds and in space plane would then position itself for re-entry. It was made of Inconel super alloy to survive the heat encountered at these speeds. The speed at which something enters the atmosphere and the angle of entry determines how high the temperature goes, heat flux, and how long that heat is felt, heat load. Here is a graph showing the heat experienced by different spacecraft. As you can see, the heat flux Starship will encounter entering Mars atmosphere at interplanetary speeds is higher than that of re-entering Earth's atmosphere. But while the heat load on Mars is short, the heat load on Earth is much longer. The Starship will come back in somewhere between what the Orion capsule experiences and what the Space Shuttle used to experience. Coming back from the Moon can generate a velocity of over 11,000 meters per second. Mars' return to Earth will be about the same. Low Earth orbital velocity is much lower, about 7,400 meters per second on contact with the atmosphere. While these returning spacecraft hit the atmosphere from much higher than 100 kilometers, at the equivalent of Mach 30 or higher, the X-15 would only climb to a maximum of 108 kilometers, hitting the atmosphere at only about Mach 6. As speed doubles from, say, Mach 3 to Mach 6, the power required to reach that speed squares, making it four times higher, and the heat load on the ship is eight times higher. Not all this heat gets absorbed into the plane and the X-15 pumped fuel around the fuselage as an active cooling system. The X-15 flew 199 times. All of these were successful except one, when Major Michael J. Adams flew past the edge of space. But while we're entering the atmosphere, he went into a hypersonic spin. As he fought to recover the aircraft, he experienced up to 15 Gs of vertical force and 8 Gs of lateral force. He kept fighting to regain control until, at an altitude of 18 kilometers, the stress on the airframe caused the X-15 to tear itself apart. The wreckage of his plane was spread across 50 square miles, and a monument was placed where the cockpit was found. One other X-15 had a hard landing that injured the pilot, but overall, for an experimental hypersonic space plane, the success of the X-15 program and the courage of its pilots is indisputable. Many rocket companies have emulated the X-15 to build successful spacecraft. 
Spaceship One was carried to high altitude by White Knight to win the Ansari X Prize. And Virgin Galactic uses an airplane called Mothership to fly Spaceship Two and Launcher One above most of the atmosphere so they can launch into space. Spaceship Two for a ballistic flight and Launcher One to go into low Earth orbit. But these are small rocket ships. What if we want to launch something bigger from a jet-powered carrier ship? This is the Astro Clipper. This spacecraft is being developed by Exodus Space Corporation. Here is an introductory video released to the public about two years ago by Exodus. Let's pause here and look at the team they had put together. Miguel Ayala was the chief executive officer when this video was made. Miguel had worked at Lockheed Martin and SpaceX. He is now at Apelian Aerospace out of California. John Cunningham was the chief financial officer. Mr. Cunningham runs the John David Consulting Group out of Dallas, Texas, and is now listed on the Exodus website as the CEO. He was also a former executive at Arthur Anderson. He probably knows how to raise a dollar or two. Frank Trevino is the chief marketing officer. He is a partner at AI Strategy and seems to be a digital marketing expert. He has a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Texas, an MBA from the University of Houston, and is working on a Master of Science degree. Richard Ullman is the Chief Technical Officer. He has worked at Boeing and DARPA. We'll forgive him for Boeing. And Michael Gurr something has experience in space shuttle operations. Sorry, Michael. Your video guy did it. This is a group of very smart people. They plan to make the Astro Clipper a two-stage vehicle. The first stage has supersonic turbojet engines to bring the ship over Mach 1 and up to about 30,000 feet, or about 9 kilometers. Above Mach 1, ramjets can come online. These are very efficient and simple, with no moving parts. Once you have reached a high enough speed for them to work. Astro Clipper also has rocket engines to boost the speed even higher. As it goes hypersonic, the Astro Clipper can then climb to the edge of space. At this point, the smaller ship at the front will release, pull clear, and fire its own rocket engines. The first stage is now a flying wing. This part of the ship will come back to land on its own. The second stage will propel itself into low Earth orbit, carry out its mission, and then come down to also land like an airplane. Where will this separation take place? Let's consider that problem in depth. At one time, the United States Air Force was considering this. This is the Lockheed D-21, as high-altitude fighter jets with advanced missile technology became a greater threat, the need for unmanned surveillance drones became more apparent. The D-21 is an advanced drone. It was planned to be launched from a modified A-12 designated M-21. It could fly at Mach 3.3 at 27 kilometers. The D-21 drone carried a high-resolution camera over a programmed path. It would then release the camera over friendly territory to be recovered by parachute. The drone would then self-destruct. I assume these would be extremely important pictures to justify that expense. There were three successful launches of a D-21 from an A-12. For all of these launches, the A-12 was in a 0.9G dive before separation. But in combat conditions, this release position is not always certain. And to go into space, it would be better to launch from level flight or even an upward angle. The images you are seeing now are from a level flight separation test. This is the only existing video record of this previously classified launch I could find. The pilot was Bill Park, a Lockheed Martin test pilot, and the launch control officer was Ray Torek. Here you see the D-21 mounted on the A-12 as it gets ready for flight, and then takes to the air. Everything looked fine at this point. Here we see the chase plane video. The D-21 lifts up, but it hits the shock wave coming off the front of the A-12, rolls 45 degrees to the left side, and smashes back down onto the A-12, impacting about here. The plane goes off camera for a few seconds, and when it comes back into view, we can see that it has been broken in half by the impact. The cockpit has survived, and the pilot and LCO stay with the falling wreckage until it reaches a safe altitude to eject. They were able to eject safely, but landed in water. Ray Torek's pressure suit seems to have been torn by the wreckage on ejection. It took on water, and he drowned. There were no further MD-21 flights. Exodus would be wise to make their separation above the Carmen line, 
where we don't have to worry too much about shockwaves. Exodus plans to build several different versions of this ship, from small test vehicles to this massive personnel carrier. Why does Exodus think there is a commercially viable use for this type of spaceship? Sure, you can take supplies to the ISS, or release satellites. But how are you going to compete with this? Starship is now planned to get up to 250 tons to low Earth orbit. The answer is Astro Clipper can't compete on cargo. It can, however, transfer people more safely than Starship. As an airplane, the rules for flight are clear. Thousands of large airplanes fly every day. Sure, it goes higher than anyone else. But it's still an airplane when it comes down. The Starship will come back to land like this. If anything goes wrong at this critical time, things will not go well. An airplane can lose all power and still safely land. The Starship will never be able to do this. It may be a long time before Starship is cleared to land with people on board. I think Exodus plans to meet Starship in orbit. Transfer people and return. Starship can take up the cargo, load itself with people, and carry out its deep space missions. On return, it can transfer the crew to either a Dragon capsule, if it's a small crew, coming back from Starbase 2 on the moon, or an Astro Clipper, if it's a lot of people, coming back from Starbase 3 on Mars. And then I think the Starship will go on to land on its own. Something to think about. Thanks for listening, and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.